podcast. I only do that on Saturday, by the way, it's just to be a little bit efficient. And I think uh, often I do the same uh, the same story. So I am on my uh, on my podcast, which I normally post a little bit later. And uh, uh, this one will be post tomorrow. And then I'm on Instagram Live. So good morning. It's uh, it's uh, ten o'clock Dallas time in the morning. Uh, we are still uh, on uh, what we call winter time, right? Daylight saving time. But tonight uh, we have to turn the clock, uh, to turn the clock back. So uh, if you're listening through this from uh, from the Netherlands, then we are exactly in sync again. Um, okay, today's topic. You know, uh, it's always uh, it's always about you know what questions do I get during the week and that's what i always want to address on instagram live obviously it has to be something uh, in in the area that i at least think i have uh, some knowledge about right so that's uh, that's what it is and i earlier this week i did a podcast on the reason why uh, why i'm doing a podcast the pod- podcast is called thrive uh, not survive after uh, child abuse so uh, welcome 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 uh, this probably will be episode number 39 on um, the podcast thrive not survive after uh, child abuse um, and uh, during the podcast I had uh, I talked a little bit about why I do the things that I do in the podcast and why I talk so often about uh, about abuse and um, try not to completely repeat what I did in the podcast because please listen uh, to that episode. I think it was episode number 36 or 35 or something. Um, but it's an important thing to do because um, I, I tend to be sometimes a little bit all over the place, <laughs> as you can call that, right? But everything I do uh, and it becomes more and more focused is actually focused on um, on empowering people who have been through an abusive, uh, abusive uh, period in their life, an abusive situation, and specifically, uh, specifically, child abuse. Right. So heavy topic. I know it's uh, it's not always uh, it's always not always nice to uh, <laughs> to talk about these things that are so heavy in life. But you know, apparently, at least I believe it's necessary. So hence, uh, hence that's the fact uh, why I do that. Now, let me give you some perspective here. You know, we have um, in uh, in Europe and the US alone, we have 600,000, just think about that for just a moment, eh? 600,000 new uh, victims every, uh, every month, uh, sorry, every year. And if you calculate that through, that comes down to one minute, uh, we have a new victim of abuse either in Europe or in the US and that counts up that you know that adds up counts up is not a really good <laughs> English term but that adds up to 1440 um, victims that's a, that's a lot just just imagine that for a moment I'm talking to you now for about three minutes right so those are three new victims Now, in a a relatively recent report, it's a pretty intensive report around abuse, um, and these are estimates, by the way, uh, is that 70, 75% actually uh, goes uh, goes unreported. So we only know 25% of what's really going on, right? So, wow, that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting take on that, right? And if 600,000, you know, is, uh, you know, on a population of maybe, what is it? You know, you have, uh, you have a billion people maybe in Europe and uh, and the U.S. together. If you take Western Europe and Europe together, together, you have like 570 in Europe and you have like 350 in in the U.S. So that's about, you know, a little bit less than 10 million. So that's about 10% of the world population maybe. Um, can you imagine that's already 600,000 so if I would if I would extrapolate that and I'm sorry you know I used to work for Texas Instrument where we really imprecise, in precise numbers and did that really well but I and, you know I do a little bit linear extra, extrapolation so don't don't worry about it but it gives you maybe 6 million people every year worldwide and that's what's reported so if I you know, multiply that times four because you know seventy percent, seventy five percent doesn't go uh, reported. That could easily be twenty, twenty five million people every year. 
Uh, I'm talking a little bit soft because I'm actually also a little bit shocked about that number. And if you if you if you think about this, and this is the reason why I start to see a slightly different um, take on it my, myself. About two years ago, I, I published the book Broken Silence. By most people that know that already, and um, and at that time. Guys, I was, uh, and still am, I'm very passionate to help people and empower them. Uh, specifically, I'm specifically focusing first and foremost of people who went through it, right? Like myself, I was abused from my seventh year until uh, until I was 12 years old. So that's very young. So I, I specifically focus to the people who have been through a situation like that. Yeah, to empower them and give them insights so that you can have a thriving life and not only have to survive. Help them to tell their story, how important that is uh, and why that's important. But but lately, actually, I, I came to a different conclusion because I, I thought a lot about, okay, that's a good thing, Jean, that you want to help people who have been uh, through sexual abuse. But what about trying to prevent it? Now, I was seven, so it's really hard to prevent something in my house because no one knew about it, right? And if you didn't, so, and, and that's typically the case with all uh, child abuse situations that m most of the time, I hope that most of the time, strange as that is to say, that we don't know about it because if you know about it, you don't do anything about it. That's really <laughs> on, the, on the wrong side of the equation, right? So m most of the time, there is no adult that knows about what's going on in that abusive situation. And it actually, in that same report, it was, it was reported that most child abuse victims start to talk about it 19 years, one nine, 19 years after, uh, after the fact. I mean, can you imagine that? You know, 19 years you sit on, on something so evil and so... And, uh, and I was thinking like, oh, really? Is that true? But it was actually true for me too. It was 19 years after the fact that I gave a little bit more publicity. And I was in a small circle. I was not even in a book like this. And, and that's typically the case. If at all. Yeah, if at all. I was really already too late to, to literally report this thing, right? When, I, when, I, when me and my sister started to talk about it, That's when we found 19 years after it happened to me. I started to find out that actually my sister went through the same thing. Can you imagine in the same family, done by the same person, 19 years after the fact. And then my uncle was still alive. We didn't want to talk about it. We also didn't want to tell to my, my, my parents who struggled for a while with it. My, my, my uncle passed away. We thought it became a moot point. And so actually we never told our parents. My parents are still alive, but my mom has Alzheimer's and my dad is 96 years old. So I hope he never finds out because it would only devastate him. And, you know, and definitely in the last years of his life, we don't want to do that to him. So anyhow, that's a choice. I'm not sure it's that the best choice I could have made, but that's the choice we made. But yeah, I just have to think about it that when I was seven, and it's just me, you know, Jean, the way you see here, right? I, I started to build up secrets in my life that I couldn't talk about. I did not know where to go to. I actually did not know even to put it in a certain context or or how to deal with it. And so for at least 19 years, if I was smart enough after 19 years, I was looking for help, but I didn't do that either. And most people don't, by the way. So all these things were, you know, going in me. I, I did not know what to do, but you had no context with it. You were reading about it. Uh, I, I started to see that my mood changes were not really, you know, they were common in our family. Therefore, I thought it was really normal. But in family, in my family, a lot of these things were going on. So logically, these things were kind of, so think about anger, uh, think about uh, feeling uh, depressed. Now, I'm a, I'm a pretty cheerful guy, as you probably have known, very extroverted. So I had good outlet for my emotions. Uh, I'm just blessed. Not had nothing to do with smartness or, or whatever. I was I was reading always a lot about self development and stuff like that. But it, I I think that matters. But it it in the same time it didn't matter. It had I, I was just lucky and blessed to do certain things that always helped me to go through. I have um, in a, in a, in a sense I have, I have a lot of the character of my dad and I know how to push through things. 
But I've seen very close by for people who are not capable of that. And, and in a lot of cases, we didn't understand what was going on until these stories came out. Now, if, you, if, you, if I add up all these reports, right, and if I talk to you about it, the reason why I do these things, so it's a little bit less exciting maybe to listen to than all the other things that I do. But if you think about it like this, right, it is also known that the abuse, specifically the child abuse victims, you know, over 70% probably have signs of depression and anxiety. Now, these are a lot of numbers, and maybe I need to do some really good calculation with someone who knows how to do that. But if you think about the impact every year, if I just go with the 600,000, right? Uh, if I just go with the 600,000 new victims every year, and uh, if, you, if you think about the impact that has on the society of every year 600,000 new victims come in and, at the, and, and through their life they will start to suffer from depression and anxiety, you can actually see what a negative hold this has on the entire society. I hope someone actually is with me and understand what the magnitude is of that. Yeah, just I'll give you a little more moment. Every year, it's not like 600,000 new ones and the other ones were gone. No, it's an add-up, right? It's, it's cumulative. It keeps going. It's compounding, right? And, uh, and, and it has a halt. So we say there's a, growing, there's a growing depression and anxiety. And, and it's good, you know. I'm, 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 I'm kudos to all the therapists who work on that. But we don't work on the cause. One of the biggest causes of depression and anxiety is right into the abuse. I hope you guys start to finally understand that, that that's where we need to start. Now, I know we can't stop it, but what I do know from my experience, and it's only one experience, and if you are a therapist or a counselor who is experienced with it, wanna have a discussion with me on it, please do. Uh, but I do know if we, guide people through helping them to tell their story. It doesn't have to be as public as I do in a book or on social media like I do right now. There are many ways to do that and we help other people to listen to it. So it doesn't have to be always in a professional setting of a counselor, a therapist or a coach, right? I know for a fact, at least from the people that I helped, that that release a lot of negative energy. Now, you might not believe in that that exists and that you have to go through a long process of therapy. And, and in some cases we have to, but in many cases we don't. And the more normal it is for people to come forward with these stories so that we can, you know, make that 19 years a lot shorter than it is right now, the better it is. And if we can release that positive energy in society, and if we can take away a big part of uh, of that depression and anxiety out of um, out of uh, society, that would do a lot good. You can we cannot even imagine, we cannot even fathom what effect that would have in uh, in society. You can only think about what the life is of someone who is not suffering from depression and anxiety, and someone who who has a life of that, the productivity, the cheerfulness, the love that the other person can give and receive in their life. You can only compare those two to get, to get a little bit of an idea how important it is to work on these things, right? Now, I'll do it in my area, right? If we find other bigger areas as well, we do the same thing. That's probably a part of what we call world healing. Now, typically, we don't want to talk about this. We, talk, we are so individual focused nowadays that we try to address every uh, problem also on an individual basis, which is great. I mean, I'm not against that. I, I do that myself in a coach. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching, which has a, a lot of effect. Uh, it is also uh, sometimes more efficient and sometimes more beneficial for the person who went through it to do some group sessions as well. But what about if that group is even bigger than that? What about if we can address this on a much higher level and we can serve people on a much higher level than we have done before, right? It's not only listening to my story. It's not only by, by getting attention and awareness for what's going on. And we talk about truly healing society uh, from 
what's going on here. Now, since it's so big and since there's such a big taboo on it, a lot of people gave up on this topic. And I know a lot of people still come back, come in it too, to do something about it. But maybe we need to address this on a slightly different level than we have done before. Right? Maybe. Just maybe. I'm just asking you a question. Well, that's at least my drive for this, right? So it's a little bit of a repeat of what I did in my podcast a few days ago. But I hope I uh, said it in a slightly different way. Also hope that you give me some questions and feedback on this. I know it's, it's by far not a very easy um, um, topic to talk about specifically not if we talk about people close by it i mean i'm talking about this is this was an uncle of mine it was the youngest brother of my of my mother for uh, i just wanted to say something bad but i'm not going to right but it, it it's, it's often it could be it could be a brother who did that to you it could be it could be a dad it's often a man by the way guys sorry that i put you uh, on the spot here but it is 90 percent it's us guys who do this to other people so we have to start there too i mean i have definitely plans for educational programs on both genders right we have to see oh so, we don't know we'll find out the more and more um it's it's good that we see uh, we see some movement in 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 it. We have of course uh, we have of course several movements. Often it is very focused on uh, very specific areas. Uh, but here is a case where I did not thought that I would go into. By the way, I I did, I did not had a had that plan in me. It just came to me as some sort of a I don't know maybe we can call it an inspiration uh or some sort of a personal breakthrough is that besides that we have to address this on a very individual level we also have to start to see this on a higher much higher level and hopefully that draws in the attention of people who are either more comfortable in it who have maybe the power in it who have more interested to take these things on from a global a global level yes let's make a little bit of a jump into uh, what's going on if it comes to pollution and what we do with our garbage eh? let's take plastic bottles for instance right it's really good that we do that on an individual level that we recycle them and that we start to use as less as we can of plastic bottles and straws and things like that that's really good but we also have to address it on a global level right and some people do that some people they just come up with really big global projects to clean out the ocean uh, some people come up with global projects how to replace plastics uh, in 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 in, uh, in the industry so you apparently need to have those levels right and for the longest time if it came to abuse i was only working on that individual and small group levels uh, I start to see things, and maybe other people have seen that before. Great, you know, reach out to me if if you think we can uh, we can collaborate on this thing. But I start to see that on the topic of sexual abuse, which I thought it was impossible, there are ways for do to do this on a much higher level than we have done that before. I'm not talking about just abuse, you know, when we're older. I mean, we need to do that to domestic violence. I'm talking specifically. Or maybe predominantly in this case about child abuse it's a very hard topic to understand and to get into uh, and to make sure that we don't happen but just think about it right if you if you, you we all were kids <laughs> one day right a lot of us do have kids just think about it that you at best find out 19 years after it happened right so I was seven when it started, 36. Can you imagine that at my the age of 36, I would go to my mom and dad and say, hey, mom and dad, 20 years ago, this happened to me. How would that make them feel? You know, they will feel miserable because what is our objective as parents? Our objective as parents is often to keep our kids happy. Yes, of course, but to keep our kids safe is often our first priority we do that the whole time be careful and stuff like that we now need they need to make their own mistakes and sometimes that doesn't go uh, that doesn't go really well right but these are the evils we don't want them to experience now, a lot of things they need to experience themselves but these are the evils that we don't want them to go through and this happened right under the nose of my parents and it's not that they didn't pay attention by the way there was enough going on in our family i wouldn't lie about that but this is definitely not what they wanted, right? And it happened right under the nose. And because Jean was too young, he did not know that he should talk about it. 
They did not know. We, had, we didn't have a family life where we could do. And most, most parents, by the way, if you do, most parents, uh, they, uh, most kids, they don't come forward with these things. That is just what, what, um, what the results show. They don't, they don't know where to go with these things because they don't understand what's going on. So let's not be naive and think it won't happen in your family because it probably will. That's the scary part of it, right? It's easy, one out of four. Right, so so you just have to go in a classroom of ki of kids, and you know, uh, in my relationship, my my uh, the mother of my my children, she is uh, she's a school teacher for her whole life, right, and um, and so we did that exercise. You know, if you look in a classroom, and you think one out of four kids actually go probably through something like that, that's a scary thought, right? But but so teachers don't talk about these things, but they need to. So she knows that we need to talk about it, but we need to. We need to bring in those projects too. And that's on that skill that I've always worked, right? And it's that skill that I've always found my drive to do these things. But like I said in the beginning of this, um, of this, uh, of this IG Live, is I see another thing that's going on. And it is we can address and should address this on a much higher level, right? So... We, I just read it actually just today again that uh, that one of the most most biggest thing that is hitting society is the rise of uh, depression and anxiety. And if you think about from the 600,000 people every year that come in uh, as a new sexual abuse victim, 70% will probably suffer at some point in their time of depression and anxiety, right? Just, to, just to imagine that how many people we actually know the reason why they have this, right? And if I only talk about Europe and Asia, uh, sorry, Europe and, and the US, it's 70% goes unreported. So you can easily multiply that number of 600,000 times four, you know, okay? That's 2.4 million people every year that we need to do that. So if we don't launch programs and initiatives to take that on for a much higher level, I don't know what we're doing then, right? We only, you know, trying to, what we say, mopping the floor while the faucet is still running. It is about time that we have programs where we stop um, that faucet from abuse from running, right? Because we, 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 we can't. And if you, if you think that has only an effect on the individual person, which is great, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm, that has been my joy for the longest time to help people on an individual level. But if you can think about all these people that would be more positive in life, what that would do for society. And I, I, I truly, not because I think I know everything better, but, but I probably do. But I, that's a joke, right? But not that I think I know everything better. But if you just think about all these people who have because of that often a very negative mindset but could have a positive mindset if you if you just study economy and you address that from an economical point of view and you could see that let's say those people increase their productivity with 25 percent i'm just taking this number you know just as a hypothesis can you imagine what that would mean for society can you imagine if one out of three marriages actually you know they fail in the u.s and in europe by the way you know that that the one number one thing that abuse uh, victims struggle with is relationships right i bet you that i can easily make a case that a lot of the reasons why people go through a divorce is because there is abuse history in in those marriages not in the marriage itself but in the history of those people i can easily make a case for that and maybe i should right so we were trying to fix it with counseling couple counseling all that kind of stuff but think about it like this think about this number that i just recently revealed in that report from just um just a few and it's a very intensive research by the way done in the u.s that most of the people who went through child abuse reported well, not even report it, come public with it, and public means tell it to someone else that's not public like I did it in a book, 19 years after the fact, 19 years of struggle, probably already had a lot of relationships in that time, same thing with me, I was 36 when I came out of the abuse closet, so to speak, that we need to change, 
right? If we can only make people talk sooner about this, that would have a huge impact on society. I'm getting emotional here, right? <laughs> Seriously, because I, I mean, it took me, maybe I'm not smart enough, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it took me long to see the, just the magnitude, just a bigger impact of the work that we're trying to do here. So please, please, this is a cry for help. And this is how I call the, pod the podcast. This is a cry for help. So please, please send me a message. Uh, uh, let me know that even if it's only one, let me know that you are with me on this. Just let me know that there is something that we can do with. Don't give me that it is hard to reach those people. And I know that, you know, firsthand that it's not easy because, you know, but everything that is important is often not easy, right? All things that are important are not easy. But let's make a change and start today, right? There's no reason to wait till, you know, the first of the year again, 2021. But, you know, we have a lot to do. There's COVID-19, specifically because it's COVID-19, because actually we already know that there are more people and more children in danger because they are more at home. So there is no reason to wait, right? There is literally no reason to wait. Now, what can we do? Let's at least start to support projects like I am doing right now. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I feel actually a little bit ashamed <laughs> to say, you know, let's support a project that I do, but I believe in it. And if there's only one person out there that believes with me, that would make a huge, a huge difference because that's two and two becomes four and so on and so on, right? And uh, and that's and that's what it is. That's the reason why I do this, right? Someone asked me this week, what is the reason? Why are you always so on to this topic? Maybe I shouldn't, but I am, right? And so that's the reason. The reason is, this is from an unimaginable magnitude. Think about it. I do it one more time before the time is over. We know six hundred thousands, right? The six hundred thousand is probably you know, from a population of 10% of the world, Europe and Asia, and Europe and US, I do it again, Europe and the USA together, right? Because we have about a million people together and we have about 7 million people, right? It's like a little bit less, it's like 10%. So if I, if I just do it time times, we talk about 6 million new victims every year. And if 70 to 75% goes unreported, and let's say that's also true for the entire world, I'm a little bit afraid that in some parts of the world that were, that number is way worse, but let's do it for this, uh, this time. Then we're talking about 24 million new victims every year. 24 million. Do you know how much that is? That's the entire population of Australia. That's how much that is, right? 24 million victims every year. You can fill Australia with it. Well, Australia is a big country, but you know what I mean, right? Every year. And from those 24, let me do some really good math here, right? From those 24 million people, right? It is probably known that 70%, yeah, 70% of those people, so that's a good 19 million people, will start to suffer from depression and anxiety. And if you... Think about what that holds every year as right? it's compounded. It's not every new year, new it's, it's it. Uh, if you can see the hold that it has on the entire world population and our society, if we could release that and turn that into positive energy, could you see that we truly could change the world together just by addressing this one thing, this one enormous thing of abuse, right? And that's what we need to see, right? And I know there are some people that can only see it on an individual level and they need to, and that's really good. And like I gave you uh, that example of people that try to help to make a cleaner earth, some people can see that on a global scale and that's good too. Everyone needs to uh, carry his weight and then we probably get the handle on this, right? Does that make sense? All right, this was Sean from the podcast uh, uh, Thrive, Not Survive After uh, Child Abuse. If you were listening to my podcast, if you were with me here on Instagram Live, then I'll see you back. Um, then I'll see you back um, next week, uh, 10 o'clock. Um, as always, uh, Dallas time, that is, right? Uh, don't forget, tonight in, 